Today marks 56 years since one of the most notorious incidents of political violence in U.S. history, the assassination of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was shot and killed on the balcony of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. The civil rights leader, accused by conservatives of being a communist agitator, had gone to Memphis to support striking sanitation workers. Now, 56 years later, the Republican Party's presumptive nominee for president is a man who celebrates political violence. Donald Trump has ominously warned of a bloodbath if he's not elected and vowed to release people who attacked the Capitol on January 6th, people he calls hostages, as one of his first acts if elected. So let's just take a moment to look at some of these so-called hostages. NBC News analyzed 15 of the January 6th defendants currently in pretrial detention. There's a former Special Forces soldier accused of spearing an officer in the face with a flagpole. One man faces January 6th charges but wasn't arrested until last year after he showed up at former President Obama's home with weapons in his van. Trump had posted a screenshot of Obama's address on social media. There's also the Florida man accused of assaulting law enforcement officers and setting off an explosive device inside a Capitol tunnel. Joining me now is Ryan Riley, NBC News justice reporter, and Harry Dunn, former Capitol Police officer who is running for Congress from Maryland. Thank you both for being here. Ryan, I want you to tell me more about these uh, so-called hostages. Yeah. So what we really tried to focus on here was those individuals who are detained pretrial, because those are the people who haven't yet been convicted of any crimes. And I think that's a reasonable way way to look at this, look at people who haven't actually been convicted by a jury or by judges and see why they're being held. And what we found is that a lot of these people are being, all these people are being held for very good reasons that judges have laid out and made individualized decisions why they need to be held. It's usually a risk of flight or a danger to the community why they're being held. Included in that group is, uh, as you mentioned, someone who threw that explosive device into the tunnel where some of the worst attacks of the day took place, where, you know, Officer Mike Fanone was dragged out of that tunnel and had a stun gun driven into his neck. That's where that, a lot of that violence took place. And a lot of those individuals who were in that tunnel at that time had ringing in their ears for days afterwards. They lost their hearing temporarily. Officers told the FBI that they believed that they were going to die. They were in this confined space being attacked by, by uh, the mob for hours, and then that explosion goes off. There's another individual uh, who NBC News first reported about two years ago, but wasn't arrested until this year, who actually fired off a gun twice uh, outside of the Capitol on January 6th, and he's one of those individuals now being held uh, in pretrial detention. One of the ones that really sticks out to me is Edward Kelly. He's an individual who was actually the fourth person to go inside the Capitol that day. He was dressed up in paramilitary um, gear. He allegedly assaulted a police officer outside, broke that window open, busted that fire door open so that the rest of the mob could come in. Nevertheless, he was released pretrial. That's how most of these cases have been handled. But he was rearrested months later because the FBI alleged that he was plotting to kill the FBI in employees who were investigating him. And his co-defendant his co in that case has actually already pleaded guilty to that crime, admitting that the two of them conspired to kill FBI agents uh, because uh, of the investigation into them. Edward Kelly has uh, pleaded not guilty in initially. Uh, he was in talks for a plea deal, but apparently that case could go to trial, which is separate and apart from the underlying January 6 charges that he's also facing. Uh, Harry Dunn, your thoughts as a, a, a police officer, a former police officer, of Donald Trump saying these people that you just heard Ryan describe are hostages who he's going to release upon becoming president if he does. Sure. Good to see you both. Um, I just get so incensed just sitting here listening to what just Ryan says. He's been on top of it and uncovering the actual truths about the thing. I will push back a little bit is he uses the words allegedly when it's not really alleged when we saw it all on tape happen. So got to push back a little bit there, right? But, the, you know, Donald Trump, just think about how much the narrative has changed from first it was Antifa to then it was no big deal to then it was a tourist visit to then we need to move on from it to now Donald Trump campaigning off of it. Uh, think about these MAGA people, the MAGA faction of the Republican Party. It's just kind of hijacked it and they're all over the place with what they want to be. It's, it's, it's a slap in the face to law enforcement. Uh, it's a slap in the face to me, to my coworkers, to the men, the brave men and women of Metropolitan Police Department who put their lives on the line to protect this democracy. Uh, so it, it's ridiculous that they're, that's where they're going right now. And uh, some of these people, Ryan, are also running for office, right? That's Not right. the There's ones who are in pretrial of... detention, but some of the <laughs> other January 6th uh, people. 
That's right. And one was actually endorsed by a sitting member of Congress. Um, Derek Evans is an individual who uh, pleaded guilty uh, to, to charges and served three uh, months behind bars. And I remember sitting through his, his hearing, and he was extremely apologetic for his conduct on January 6th. He actually did it via Zoom, so he had the opportunity to put a giant photo of his young children in the background to sort of make a sympathetic uh, appeal to the judge there. Um, and I think that, you know, the judge, Judge Lamberth, who's actually spoken out very strongly about uh, the need to bring people back to reality about what happened on January 6th, um, I think was somewhat, you know, sympathetic uh, to him because he did seem apologetic, but he's just completely reversed course and is now running on this notion that, you know, this was all a setup and that, you know, the election was still stolen and that, you know, Joe Biden is going after the quote unquote patriots uh, who were supporting Donald Trump on January 6th. So a real reversal of what he said in court versus what he's saying, you know, I guess on the campaign trail now at this point. Mm. Uh, Harry Dunn, there's also Donald Trump saying that he plans to jail his political opponents if he comes back in. So he wants to free the violent felons who beat police officers and fired guns in the air and, and, and committed various crimes. But he says he wants to jail his political opponents. Is that something that you worry about? We know that some of the January 6th uh, committee members are feeling that they would have a target on them. Um, you've been vocal, too. Your thoughts? Yeah, so going back to what you just said about those individuals that are running for Congress, guess what? So with this good guy right here, it's very important for good people to stand up and fight back against it. Lord forbid if we get people like that in Congress. And to speak about the whole MAGA thing, the individuals, like you said, that are running, um, <laughs> coincidentally, as I come out and speaking about fighting against MAGA, MAGA money entered the race that I'm in right mm -hmm. now in a, in a Maryland Democratic primary you have a group that supports MAGA insurrectionists and um, fund, funded Donald Trump, literally donating money in my race right now because they know I'm out to get them and going to hold them accountable. But as far as what Donald Trump, I mean, the, the target on lawmakers back, you're right. Absolutely. They should they should be afraid because, I mean, we got to start taking Donald Trump at his word. Just the fact that he said he's going to be a dictator and, all, you know, he, he's making these these threats. At what point do we yeah. continue? We stop taking him as a joke. And we have to act. We have to stand up. We have to vote. It's very important for everybody to get involved. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm running right now. I mean, Lord forbid, if we get three people that are that stormed the Capitol on January 6th that are that are legislating our, our government, I, what are we doing? Yeah. It's a great question. Well said. Ryan Riley, excellent reporting. Uh, thank you very much. And The Sedition Hunters is Ryan's book. You all should pick that up, too. Harry Dunn, uh, thank you very much. Best of luck in your campaign. But we begin tonight in Enid, Oklahoma, a town that voted this week to remove city council member Judd Blevins after local activists discovered that not only did he once lead an Oklahoma chapter of the white nationalist group Identity Europa, which they pretentiously spell with a V where the U should be. But he also was one of the torch-wielding neo-Nazis chanting, Jews will not replace us, in Charlottesville, Virginia, in August 2017, something NBC News reporter Brandy Zadrozny confronted him about last month. You were a leader in an Oklahoma chapter of a white nationalist organization, and I want to know if you have any explanation to that. Now, Why did you march and unite the right? Me. Why did you hold a tiki torch? Blevins has somehow denied that he has ever been a white supremacist. But at a candidate forum last week, he said his activism was motivated by the same issues that got Donald Trump elected in 2016. And he also defended marching in Charlottesville, saying he only did it to preserve the precious statues of the Southern troops who went to war against the U.S. military, which he's also a veteran of. Now, you may remember that the march was led in part by a man named Richard Spencer, who does admit proudly to being a white supremacist and who has in the past called for peaceful ethnic cleansing of America and advocated for a white ethno state and who, upon Trump's 2016 win, urged his supporters to, quote, to, uh, to, to chant hail Trump with their arms raised and party like it's 1933, you know, the year that Hitler came to power in Germany. Spencer was a headline speaker at that 2017 Unite the Right rally, spouting this ideology to an audience of several white supremacist groups, including Identity Europa with a V. But Spencer was also, believe it or not, classmates at Duke University with none other than Stephen Miller, 
a senior Trump advisor who wrote some of Trump's most inflammatory speeches and who has also and who also helped create the family separation policy that led to several migrant babies being ripped from their mother's arms. The two were reportedly members of Duke's conservative union. And when Miller was given the White House role in 2016, Spencer praised him, saying Miller could do, quote, good things for white America. Nowadays, Miller runs an organization called America First Legal, which has filed multiple lawsuits aimed at eviscerating DEI programs and fighting anti-white racism, which Judd Blevins has said is also his purpose as an activist. But back to Richard Spencer for a moment. What he is most known for, other than Charlottesville, is coining the term alt-right, basically as a more palatable, palatable way of saying white supremacist. Which brings me to another familiar face, Steve Bannon. Bannon, of course, was co-founder of Breitbart News, which he described as the platform for the alt-right, essentially a safe haven for Spencer and friends. And when Donald Trump ran for president in 2016, Bannon was appointed chief executive officer of his campaign, which ultimately led to a spot as chief strategist in the Trump administration, creating a direct line of white nationalism to the White House, the highest level of government. And, well, you know the rest. This is how white nationalism has become normalized in American politics. Someone like Judd Blevins wouldn't even have been able to get elected in the first place if it weren't for the likes of Donald Trump and his ability to make white supremacy mainstream. I mean, it, it may be the one thing, besides getting the party of Reagan to love Russia, that he was actually able to do that no one else has. Because this ideology has always existed, and people have tried in the past to implement it in our government many times. But they've all failed, because they never have been able to attach this rot to a major political party until now, with Trump's help. And with his help, White nationalism has grafted itself onto the Republican Party with almost zero resistance from Republicans. Republicans just let it happen. And because of that utter cowardice, they have allowed Richard Spencer's dream to become a reality. Joining me now is Brandi Zdrozny, NBC News senior reporter, and Stuart Stevens, senior advisor to the Lincoln Project and former Republican strategist. Brandi, great job in that reporting on Judd Blevins. Did you ever get an answer to why he marched in Charlottesville, other than he said he was protecting the statues, and why he led a chapter of Identity Evropa? They spell it's Europa, but they spell it with a V because they're pretentious. Um, yeah, that's right. That's exactly why that uh, is the case. But um, it's very silly. Um, but yeah, so I, I've talked to Judd Blevins several times. Um, he has never given me a direct answer to that question. He did have to say something at a candidate's forum when he was directly asked for the first time really in public in a way that he couldn't really wriggle out of. And he said things like he did not like the anti-white um, messaging of the media. He said that he, for the same reason, he ex specifically invoked Donald Trump and said the same reason that Donald Trump was elected, anti-immigrant, um, said anti-immigrant stuff. You know, it, it's the, it is the same thing that we've been seeing, the same thing that he said propelled Donald Trump to the national stage in 2016, or the same thing that led him to pick up a tiki torch that day. And so, um, yeah, I think it's something that we've seen all too often. I think the thing with Judd Blevins here is that he really was a bridge too far holding that tiki torch. You know, people are sort of trying to rewrite January 6th, and some people have tried to rewrite um, the Charlottesville Unite you know, the Right rally. But when you see those images and you see those angry white men yelling, Jews will not replace us, that is a really hard history to rewrite, and it wasn't enough in Enid, Oklahoma. Yeah, Jews will not replace us. Kind of hard to rewrite. Kind of hard to say that that was a, a, a tourist visit. Uh, Kind of hard to do that. Um, but, you know, it, it is true, Stuart, that, you know, things that would have been unthinkable in the Republican Party that you remember um, are now thinkable. Um, I, this would have been unthinkable. Let me show you Stephen Miller. Stephen Miller, and this is a couple of years ago, he created this in 2022. An ad like this would have been laughed out of existence um, even 10 years ago. But now he puts it out there and it's totally normal. Here's uh, Stephen Miller's ad. When did racism against white people become okay? Joe Biden put white people last in line for COVID relief funds. Kamala Harris said disaster aid should go to non-white citizens first. Liberal politicians block access to medicine based on skin color. Progressive corporations, airlines, universities, all openly discriminate against white Americans. 
Racism is always wrong. The left's anti-white bigotry must stop. Okay, none of that is true. I just will put that out there. That was all a bunch of lies. But you worked in Republican politics for a long time, my friend. Can you ever imagine having seen something like that run by somebody who identifies with the Republican Party? You know, look, I, I'm really glad we're talking about this because I don't think we talk about Trumpism and race enough. Um, all of this nonsense that it's about some sort of economic stress. Um, it, it, look, Trump's coalition is 85 percent white in a country that is becoming a minority majority country. And that is the underlying aspect of this. You know, race has always been, I think, the original sin of the modern Republican Party. We failed at that when I worked in the party. You go back to Eisenhower, he got 39 percent of the black vote. It fell to 7 percent with Goldwater. Trump got 8 percent. That's one point every 56 years. But at least when I worked in the party, we admitted it was a failure. I mean, Ken Melman, who was chairman of the party, went before the NAACP and apologized for the Southern strategy. And there were efforts to try to, to change this. But really, you know, the, the party failed. The party failed at a policy level to ever put forth a program that appealed to more non-white Americans, particularly African Americans. And now it's become just a full embrace of racism that the Republican Party is. And if you're for the Republican Party, this is what you are for. You, this isn't a cafeteria. You can't take from this and this and this. You got the whole buffet. And this is what it is. And you have to come to grips with that. Yeah, I mean, it's an American problem. I mean, look, the Democrats had their turn. Let's just be clear. The Democrats used to have the Klan folks in their side. But there was a white flight out of the Democratic Party into the Republican Party once black voters started voting in a party that was an anathema to them uh, at one time. They were all Republicans at one point. But you're absolutely right. There was this shift. And look, I'm old enough to remember Jack Kemp, friends of mine who got into, who were black folks that are black Republicans. They came in because of Jack Kemp and the elder George uh, Herbert Walker Bush. So it is, it's, it's a very different party now. And Brandy, you've reported a lot on kind of what has happened. Um, what about this town? This is a white town. It's run by a conservative Republican mayor. The Judd Blevins thing was even too much for them. What were Republicans telling you about why they found this person to be unacceptable? So it's a very, very conservative Republican place. And, you know, I did talk to a lot of conservative Republicans and a lot of them told me, you know, this is not who we are. This, you know, someone that I talked to yesterday, in fact, said I was in Virginia. I just happened to be there after Charlottesville, like a week after Charlottesville. And she said it was so raw there. People were so upset for, you know, for good reason. And I just don't I don't we don't want to go back to that. You know, we want to move forward there. You know, you say that this is the Republican Party, and I see what you mean. But for a lot of folks in Enid, Oklahoma, that is not what they want. That is not the, you know, lower taxes and conservatism that they really align themselves with. And they don't want to be a part of that. That, to me, is sort of, I, I was inspired and filled a little with hope. And I also, you know, also want to say that shame is a very powerful thing. And when you give people a choice and you say, you either need to pick what you are and what you aren't. And that's what this was with the recall election. I think a lot of people came out because they just did not want Enid to be associated do, do they, with that. Do they still support Donald Trump, though? Many of them do. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.